ahead and, and uh, get started with this. I, I heard several themes over the two days. Maybe, maybe that's just the way I kind of think, but I heard a lot about teamwork, the importance of teamwork, big teams, uh, working together to make big stories happen. And I think that's definitely true with our last, you know, with the Weather Channel, but we heard it from um, the Inquirer, we heard it from USA Today, The Wall, and we heard it, you know, from uh, Justin, who wasn't here, but he was even talking about being teammates with his competitors. So heard a lot of that, heard a lot about passion. Um, so these are some of the themes that kind of resonated with, uh, with me. And I wonder what you guys, what resonated with you about each other's presentations? Because I know many of you had said to me, this is really inspiring to, to hear what uh, these other people are doing. So talk to each other in this, and I'm just gonna let you have control of this conversation. So um, I, I can start by just saying that um, I think the inspiring part is, uh, for me, is that we're so close to the work we're doing, we're heads down a lot of times, and, um, and we don't step back and appreciate that there are so many other professionals around the country, around the world, who are doing the same kind of work or similar work, and they are just as passionate about it. So it makes me feel really good about the future of, of journalism because just in the two days we've been here, we've seen people who are um, who are doing all kinds of different work in in the in the uh, journalism arena. Every one of them is <clears throat> putting in long hours, and um, and they're and they're putting out amazing stuff. So, so just to know that um, take that it, it, this has given me an opportunity to just kind of step back and appreciate all the work that's being done by other people in our profession. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, so, you know, speaking to the whole, uh, the side of, uh, you know, when it comes to the passion that the work uh, that everyone uh, does, for me, it, it was truly inspiring. You know, I still feel like I'm an outside observer that just happened uh, to have a seat at the table. So when I'm learning about the, the stories and the approaches that the, each of these individuals take when it comes to telling these stories, uh, I, I walk away wanting to learn more about this industry. How can I better myself when it comes to storytelling, more specifically on the interactive side? But you know, it was one of those things where this has been uh, an amazing two days. Uh, you know, I've attended other symposium journalism conferences, and this particular one here, I was just I was just floored by the content, and just want to say thanks to everyone. Yeah, building on that, I'm very bad at these things it seems. Uh, I'm just, I think I was, one of the things that was most inspiring was that everyone is putting themselves out there, sticking their necks out and trying things that may be, may be risky, unsafe, unwise, uh, and also hearing about the immense challenges that everyone deals with in many different ways. Uh, you know, we went through a lot of the technical challenges and logistical challenges that we dealt with, but I think that that resonates across all of the presentations. and. Uh, that was even a stark reminder for me, even on projects that I worked on, hearing some of the perspectives of, of my teammates uh, and returning to some of those memories from a different, a different, uh, different view. Yeah, what I, <clears throat> what I found inspiring is uh, research, preparation, data, just the things that are unseen to produce something that is visceral, felt, and hits you in the gut, you know, from you know, predicting the weather and keeping people safe to try and produce images and video that, and interactive media that's compelling. You don't have to, you know, show all the, who's pulling the strings behind, but there is a lot of work involved and in, in, uh, so that your passion and vision translates into something that communicates. I'm going to use the handheld too because I'm not sure if the lava is working. But um, one of the things I was going to say uh, about the, the the topic of teamwork is um, we've all been so impressed not just by each other but 
by what's happening here in Athens and on this campus with regard to technology and new ways of storytelling. I mean, I think that was, that was something that each of our presentations touched on. You know, content is always gonna be king. It's just the manner by which audiences receive that news and information is going to change. Um, you know, who would have thought that USA Today and Weather Channel would be relying on experts from the video gaming industry? Um, you have a major here now in video gaming uh, because that technology can be used to tell news and information stories. And so um, while the, the delivery mechanisms may change, um, content is always king. And if you stick around long enough, you find that what's old is new again. I am totally invigorated by the podcast business right now. And didn't we all think that TV had taken over radio many years ago? So I tell people all the time at my stage in my career, uh, I, I'm in cable television, and within the the duration of the TV business, you know, cable TV is starting to be a dinosaur because people are cutting the cord. And so, how will we get our storytelling out there? It's going to take some different types of brains in the room to come up with what the solutions are. Um, but it doesn't mean that the audience won't be thirsty for information. Yeah, I'll just note that this. Uh, was really special uh, two days, um, and the word refreshing uh, is in my head. Uh, the news right now feels like it's just kind of on a loop, and to come here and see what is happening and the scope, it's global, um, and it all comes down to people. It was just, uh, it was just really refreshing to see all this hard work and these amazing um, stories come to life by you know, everybody up on the stage. Um, I'm just really inspired by all of you. Um, you're putting yourselves out there, and and to be in the same room with you is great because usually we're just working on our own, doing our thing. But it's something special to be in sharing a space together and sharing our work as well. So I honor you and thank you to everyone for coming and having us here. <laughs> So I have one that I've been thinking about, and we didn't uh, we didn't get into it a whole lot, but obviously we all, um, as part of our work, everybody's kind of looking to the bottom line, and how are we, through the work that we do, going to help to support um, revenues, drive revenues for our companies? Because if we want to keep having jobs, you know that's got to happen. And even though as journalists we separate ourselves from that, we also have to think about you know what can we do, what can we develop, how can we bring ideas to the table that will help our companies, um, you know, continue con continue to make money. So I wondered if you guys all had thoughts about that. Anyone on the on the panel about what that looks like going forward? What the, what the cost savings? Well, just how how can we how can we help to um, what role do we play, I guess, in helping to drive revenues for our companies? I have, I have one small example of that. Um, um, we have recently, at the Weather Channel, joined a consortium of media outlets called the Climate Desk. Um, didn't really know what we might get from that partnership, but it seemed like in 2019, it was an important thing to do. And so uh, I think there are 20 news and information media outlets that are involved um, in the climate desk and the weather channel is the only video first TV partner um, and so I'm in a slack channel conversation with their editors every day exchanging ideas telling them hey this is something we're working on they've put us in contact with um, researchers or experts or reporters in uh, certain areas that I may not know about if I didn't have that open forum of collaboration with other journalists who are working on the same topic. And so I think that we're kind of going to figure it out on our own. Our corporate um, ownership may not figure it out for us um, and may not realize the benefit uh, up front uh, to their bottom lines, but collaboration is key. Um, and I think that more sharing of information is going to get us there rather than less with the competition. You know, to, to kind of funnel up on it, um, my team and I, were in a very unique position in the sense of our goals are not tied to revenue. I know that that will change at some point. But our approach is 
to reach a new audience. Um, you, you know, when folks think about USA Today and, and other uh, news organizations almost as legacy, it's old school. Uh, it, they talk about the paper. Um, so for us, driving uh, you know, a digital focused interactive story, uh, while we don't want to alienate our existing uh, audience, what we do want to do is, is reach out to a new, younger, more tech savvy uh, audience. And I feel fortunate enough that we have the flexibility to, to explore that. Uh, you know, we do have a long-term vision of where things can go, but it really does come down to collaboration. I mean, it's one of those things where my team and I, we can't figure this out ourselves. We have to work with other folks who are traditional storytellers um, and then telling the right story for the right audience on the right platform. Uh, we'll continue to, to grow things, but it's one of the challenges that, that uh, kind of drives, drives, drives me. So, you know, we're fortunate for now. Um, I know that's going to be much more of a challenge, and we'll see where things go. You know, I did have a question for you, Rich, actually. <laughs> um, as I was watching your presentation, um, you were showing an example. You had mentioned that uh, you were running away from the police with the crowds. What I'm curious to, to hear from your perspective is how do you balance the flexibility and essentially the job that you're trying to do with your own personal safety, especially when you're, you know, with several of the exa examples that you shared. Um, I don't know if you can sh share some insights. Oh yeah, on, the, <clears throat> on those photos from the last days of Standing Rock protest, um, you know, I, I knew I had to get pictures, but I knew that if I got arrested, you'd also risk losing your data, your cards, because you might not necessarily get back those images. And a friend of mine did get arrested because you know she stayed too close to the action, and she got this great image, but then you know it took weeks to get the that one image back. So it's a balancing act on whether, you know, what you, the cost benefit um, of the situation is. It's probably the only upside of my economics major as an undergrad, is I go through this analysis all the time and uh, apply it to photography. not sure this is a, a question, but at least I'll tell a quick story. <laughs> and I, I hope it will stir a, a, an answer. I've really, really gotten a lot out of the last two days. Out of the 11, uh, this is our 11th to attend. So uh, we have a good, good sense of where the group is going and where our country in the, in the School of Journalism and in VizCom is is headed, and so the quick story I want to tell you relates to how, I think maybe one of the first persons who spoke, how do you um, reconcile the values and uh, work that you do that affects the company? And that can't, you want to keep the company alive because that's where your job is. And, uh, I taught from 1960 at the University of Minnesota, started their photojournalism program. It lasted through, for me, um, 76. And I was a full professor then and tenured for life. And my wife and I decided it was time to hang it up and do something else, in which I'm sure my parents thought I was really smoking the weed. <laughs> But uh, it, I don't need to go into that. I was that treated very fairly by my colleagues, and my salary was fair and all that. But when I looked at, at age 40 to age 65, what was going to be the financial situation, and would it be where we wanted to be? And the answer was no. And so then the answer was, well, do you wait till you're 50 to start or not? And the answer was no. If you want to do it, do it now. So we started this small business in Minneapolis, uh, which dealt with presenting um, uh, detail and information to both uh, the employees 
and the uh, customers of large companies. We were lucky to have Target in town. Uh, we also were lucky to have two old guys up in the northern part of Minnesota welding together snowmobiles. <laughs> it was Polaris. And so we right away got to, I left the university, we started the business in our basement, we had one competitor in town, and we very quickly had two good customers. Then we would help them figure out the creative strategy of what they wanted to have in a meeting, and then we would create all the parts that they needed, including the delivery, which might have been in uh, Los Angeles or Las some Vegas. other, Las Vegas, wherever. Anyway, um, it, it had a nice start and it grew very nicely and we were down, we started in our basement, but we were in downtown in a year. Uh, as this business grew, we, we knew, it, we hoped it would grow, but we knew the reason it was growing is because the use of the printed media to read was on a down, downward spiral. And it had been, and we knew it when we made the choice. And so we knew that our customers had to be d needing ways to reach their, their customers and their employees. And if they weren't gonna read, they had to have some other way to get them. And so our idea was we'd put together these meetings with such fun and such life that they wouldn't want to get out of the meeting even if they could. So you made it so they were, they were a captive audience and you really got it made, the message, and when they left, they had it. And if we could do that, we could help them replace the printed media. And to a degree, I think it worked. Um, so, I'm, I'm listening to what all you folks are saying today. And just very recently, I had a meeting with a person who is the director of a school of journalism, someplace, we'll say, not here. And, uh, I asked this person, this was a young woman, relatively young, and uh, has a PhD. And so I said, I don't, I don't want to ask you these questions, and I don't mean to be critical of you. But I have this little AV, which were two newspapers. One was an old Wall Street Journal. The other was a current one. So I said, did you ever, you probably don't regularly use the Wall Street Journal. No, she didn't. And I said, I'm not surprised. You're not, 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 it's not bad because you don't look at it. That's okay. But now I want to ask, did you, did you know about how the Wall Street Journal communicated in pictures years ago? No, not exactly. Well, I said, they never had a photograph. It was always drawings. And nobody could, it was a joke. You know, they wouldn't run a photograph. Well, then came along the changes in journalism. And now you take a look at the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> My God, pictures that were 14 inches wide, and maybe 10 feet, uh, 10 inches uh, high, all in color. Good God, what a change. Well, what was it? What made that happen? Answer, money. Now, how did the money part work? Well, God, they were letting all their employees go, so they had nobody left to write stories. And so then they discovered a magical medium, a photograph. And guess what? People really liked photographs. They actually got a lot out of reading photographs and the captions. 
And my God, you could put in an 11 by 14 color picture for just a tiny fraction of what it would cost to have a, an, an experienced, capable reporter out gathering data, coming back, having help with editing, cutting, trimming, deciding where, moving it. I mean, there was no choice of what to do but to use pictures. And why not put them in color because it didn't cost that much more. Okay, so that's my story. Now, how do you put it into use? Well, what it should say, each of you who are, you, you people are working and most of the students now are gone. <laughs> and they're the ones I really would want to talk to about this. The point is that in the future, I don't think journalism is all done. I just think that we will have different ways that we do our communication and that everybody is going to need it. Whatever it comes in, whether it's a, a, a thing that looks like a Dairy Queen ice cream cone or whatever, I don't know what it'll be. but. I believe that there is this need and it will continue to be needed and used and there will need to be students, uh, students who graduate and are capable, really capable with communication. So I think, and some of you have hinted this, I think we, are, it's not all over. But it ain't the hand drawn pictures that were in the Wall Street Journal. It's a 11 by 14 color picture that people can learn from and, and uh, appreciate. Okay, I'm done. Now, comments. <laughs> As you're formulating your comment, we're really glad that that business was successful, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm sure you were, but it's been wonderful to have some of the uh, proceeds of that to fund the Schoonerman Symposium. Okay, thank you. Um, uh -huh. no, I'll use this one. Okay, um, a reaction. I something that made me think of, of as you were talking um, is uh, new uh, photos being used to cover uh, news stories, and it occurred to me that uh, we're at a state now too where the the opposite is true because of social media and things going viral um, with news with pictures and and videos. Um, you'll see it now at the end of a lot of end of news segments, you know, um, that, that that would have never happened before. But we're now showing you this picture because that's what everybody's talking about. And, you know, we're going to make it now part of the news. So it's interesting that it, it, it works sort of both ways right now. One question I have for Tanya in the refugee camps. Are there um, people who are trying to tell their story? I mean, do they have access to at least some kind of technology where they can try to get their own story out? What I found most fascinating reporting in the refugee camps is everyone, everyone had a cell phone. And almost every refugee I interviewed had video footage that was shared amongst them on you know, the brutality of the military, dead bodies, among other things. So yeah, social, they use social media as well. I am Facebook friends and on WhatsApp with several Rohingya leaders. Um, and they even have their own podcast um, radio where they're um, sharing information about what's going on in the camps and what's happening to their friends and family in Myanmar. Um, so I do see the use of communication and social media um, amongst them as well. I did notice that's a great question. And I also would like to add a point to what your question was. And I think um, storytelling is shifting. The way we tell our stories are different from, I mean, I can speak to video and the way broadcast journalism traditionally worked. Um, and now more and more I'm seeing women of color, um, reporters like myself, who aren't just parachute reporters, but people who actually understand 
context and can you know somewhat identify with what's happening to the people offer another layer to storytelling, especially in American media. And um, I'm seeing more and more people like that these days, and I think that's something important to highlight as well. I was going to just add another comment um, following up on Mr. Schuneman's um, comments. I think one of the things that might become that big 11 by 14 photo is is data. I think that a lot of what we're going to be doing moving forward is going to be more founded in data. Um, it's one of the ways that we're going to be able to continue to um, prove our credibility and, and, and remain credible. Um, I think it's going to be more and more important that we have... Um, that we, can, that, that we can show that we are credible sources for the information that we're putting out there. So I think there's, I, I think there's gonna be a lot going on in data, data visualization as we move forward. Exactly, first of all, thank you for that excellent story, which is already building a little bit of a conversation here because that's exactly what I was going to bring up. Uh, you mentioned values and how to, you know, how to deal with change and, and retaining those values. I think that you know, Annette's exactly right. Uh, the, not only is, are the media changing, not only the values sometimes change a bit too, but the overall mission and, uh, and goal of grinding truth uh, and information out of the world, the institutions, the workflows, uh, the principles and values that we uphold to do that, those hopefully are not going away anytime soon. And there's an immense challenge and need even today, even at this late hour, even with all the incursions from technology companies and all of these you know, severe risks and challenges, there's still this opportunity and need to figure out how do we store, how do we, we already know how to gather, but how do we store, share, and transmit all of this information? And how do we do it in a way that is, uh, that follows the ethics that we need to uphold, but also, is smart enough and advanced enough to get to our modern audiences and all these different platforms. And I think that it's, you know, as you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, things just keep coming back around. We come back around to the same concepts repeatedly because uh, they, they are true. And I think that that is the opportunity now, which must be seized immediately. And it may not be those of us sitting on this stage, perhaps. Uh, there are others in our organizations whose uh, charge this is. Uh, maybe we need to prod them further than we have uh, in some cases, I'm guessing many cases. Uh, but anyway, thank you again. I think that that's, uh, that's the challenge and figuring that out and how it connects to the ways that we're capturing and presenting this information. That's, that's it, that's what's exciting. And, and you know, there's, as you put it, there's, a, there's still a huge road ahead and someone's gonna do it and it may well be us. Um, I believe this question is probably more for either the Weather Channel or USA Today, but are there, have there been um, any efforts to create like a climate change internship for students that's particularly focused on climate change? And if so, whom do we contact about that? <laughs> There's now a, oh, a heroin beat, so anybody? We typically um, have two tracks for our internships. One is the scientist side of the house, and one is the TV production side of the house. So we're more generalists in that sense, and we like for all of our interns to get a robust education while they're spending time at the Weather Channel. So we probably wouldn't do such a niche um, internship yet, uh, but maybe it's coming. <laughs> Yeah, on that same point, we don't have uh, an internship like that either, but I think that there's definitely an opportunity to do that, uh, even with the existing internship program that we have. Uh, we already have news, news interns who would be working on stories like that. We already have those professionals, but also due to the nature of our network at least, there is also an opportunity to work uh, with people like Ian James and Sammy Roth across the country who are working on specific initiatives like newsletters and et cetera that are specifically focused on climate change. So no, it doesn't exist, but I think there's an opportunity right now to, uh, to do something like that for students. A student question, yay. <laughs> All right. 
right. Thank you for coming, by the way. Um, my question, I'll sit down, I don't know why I'm standing. My question is um, for Richard, but anyone can answer it. They want to, or they feel like, you know, inspired. So it's like a two-part question. I'll do my first question first is, do you like regard your photojournalism and your work as a, like a platform for activism? Um, no, I don't. And um, that, that line has to be uh, clear as a journalist. You definitely can be sympathetic to your subject, empathetic, but you definitely don't want to be considered an activist. I mean, there, was, uh, there were several photographers who were there who were activist photographers, I would call them. And some of them labeled themselves as journalists, and I would not do that because, you know, they would raise their hands in support in the marches. And that's, that's a step over the line. Once you do that, you're no longer, you know, uh, a journalist. So, I mean, I consider myself sympathetic to my subjects, for sure. Um, and I, I want to understand their motivation as human beings and their suffering. But definitely, I don't, I don't really, I don't consider myself an activist. Um, I would say I am first and foremost a journalist, but I'm also a human being. So when I see atrocity and human suffering on a large scale, I, I think it's so important to practice empathy, and that's something I stick to in all of my reports when covering crisis. Um, so yeah, journalism is important. Maintaining ethics of journalism is important. But at the same time, my healing as a huge, like seeing traumatic things and and not having um, not being human about it, being a robot about it is also something I I, I, I could never do, if that makes sense. Yeah, I get that. Um, I do get the like part two where it's like there's a very distinct line between engaging and being a participant in things and being a journalist, but I guess my only response to that would be like, with Southern Horrors, right, and Ida B. Wells, and Ida B. Wells from the 1800s, she's definitely a journalist, but I also would say she's absolutely an activist as well. So I think, I don't know, I think the line is clear, but I think it's less clear than people think. But my second question is, um, how do you practice like self-care when you're covering such like terrible, heavy things constantly and seeing it so much? Um, I don't know, it's, 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 I get asked that question a lot. Um, I forgot to mention this because it was asked before. One thing that really helps me is great food. I love to eat. <laughs> so it's like the basic things, right? Sleeping, eating, and then talking to people that I love, um, my friends, my family. Um, and then I also have a therapist. I try to meditate, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, things like that. I've learned that keeping the basics in check is, is so important and enjoying like the little things. So after I leave the refugee camps, I go to my hotel and then there's, um, well, alcohol's illegal there, so we'll like have this black market guy come in and. <laughs> give us, you know, get us some beer that we pay $10 for and just, you know, have a beer and just debrief and relax. So it's not that complicated. It's just the little things. Do you have a response, Richard? Pardon? I'm oh, sorry. Do you have a response, Richard? Oh. Um, <laughs> funny enough, we have similar survival mechanisms. <laughs> yeah. I don't drink anymore, but yeah, beer is nice. Um, good food, um, get enough sleep, because uh, you know when you sleep, it's a way of, of your brain to rest and recharge and uh, get rid of some of the toxicity that's going on when you witness so much trauma. But also talking to your colleague if you're in the field and uh, and uh, just having quiet time to reflect and on your, you know, your mission, and that you're here to tell a story and 
for the betterment of humanity. So. Cool. Thank you. When you get done, can you give it to her? Yes. Hello. I am currently in a class about journalism and trauma. And one of the things that we've been talking about recently is the Kent State shootings and how it's a traumatic event, but not everyone sees the trauma in the same way. Uh, because of the political tensions at the time, some people saw the shooting of the students as an act of aggression. Some people saw it as that's what the students deserve. And you see a lot of this back and forth. Uh, this is mostly for you. I wanted to ask, now that you were in two situations, the Dakota Pipeline and the uh, Rohingya Muslim uh, problems in Myanmar, did you see those sort of political back and forths and how did you try to, did you try to express that or how did you try to handle that in your reporting? Okay, can you rephrase your question? Just like, I'm a little... Uh, <laughs> I uh, apologize. Did no, no, you, no, it's fine. Just like a quick. Did you see any um, political discourse overreaching the tragedy that you were trying to report? Political discourse? Yeah. I still don't understand. Can you explain? What do you mean? Ah. Oh, no. Luckily, the network I work for, PBS NewsHour, ha is incredible. Um, I have complete editorial. Um, they, they value my editorial um, opinion on, on the stories that I report on. So I never, there was never a moment where I sensed that a story was being swayed or um, leaning in a particular direction for the betterment of you know, for in, in relation to politics. Um, but I do know of some networks that do have done that. And having been a freelancer for almost a decade, I've, I have noticed that there are people do, organizations do have their own interests in mind and it's important to be wary of that. And that's why it's important to maintain your ethics as a journalist and stand your ground when reporting, even if it means you lose that gig because at the end of the day, it's my reputation and I'm about telling the truth, and I'm not going to sway what I think are, know are facts for anybody. Uh, did that answer it? Yeah, okay. thank you. OK, good. Um, so diversity is like a key mission at OU, but it's also sometimes a struggle on our campus. So I was wondering, like, uh, kind of in general, how you guys are sort of aware of that? Uh, I know a lot of you are freelancers, but how are you aware of that in either, like, working in your newsrooms with your staff, but also, like, picking out characters, like Tanya said, seeing women of color on television and writing stories. So picking out characters and addressing your audience and just in the general work you do. Sorry, I keep talking. But that's such a valuable point you brought up. I mean, diversity is so important. That's why I'm so honored to be here and recognized. I think there are so many talented journalists that are people of color and it's just, it, it, and they need that, that visibility and that space to share their work. So it, it's so important. And that's why I fight the good fight. I just keep showing up, saying, hey, I exist, <laughs> you know, doing, you know, then rich. I think you, you might have something to say about that. Sorry. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, the more voices that reflect your audience, you know, the better the coverage will be. And um, that's just all there is to it. Um, if, your, if your report comes from a monolithic point of view, then it will not be very balanced. So, um, yeah, it's a struggle for newsrooms to keep a diverse workforce, especially in a newspaper environment. You know, we've had a lot of uh, minority journalists come, but they don't stay very long. So we're struggling to figure out what is it about the environment that's, you know, that's not as appealing for these talented journalists to stay. And it's a challenge when you see 
around newsrooms around the country where you know you'll be there for a few years and then there's a round of layoffs. So, um, but. Uh, Almost every newsroom I visited, I've noticed the lack of diversity, and I point it out every time. And it's so fundamentally important to have diversity because, like Rich said, how will you get those different perspectives if you do not have? And that's part of the the connection to political swaying towards a, a particular direction. If you do not have a diverse group of people to give you different perspectives, then how will you tell good news? How will you tell good stories? I want to add one thing. This is not at all from my time at the Weather Channel, but from my time in other newsrooms. Um, I just want to give you guys hope as the next generation coming up in our industry that you will have a much different reception when you offer that kind of feedback, like what Tanya just said. I remember a time, you know, 15 years ago as a younger woman in a newsroom when I did not feel empowered, even if I tried to question even the next layer up of management, hey, are we concerned about there only being, you know, white males on this panel when we're talking about something that involves women's health? Maybe we should book some other people for this conversation this afternoon. Um, and I have to say that now more than any time in my career, um, I think that employees rank and file feel much more empowered to call management out. There's many more protective layers for people um, to feel like they're not gonna be um, fired or there won't be some kind of, of um, you know, action taken against them for questioning the authority. And I think that that has only grown each year as I see more and more young journalists enter the workforce. Um, and I think those conversations are out in the open now. Uh, and, and one thing, going back to what Sean's point was about data visualization being so important, um, there's something coming next year that we all have to accept, and that is the U.S. Census. And the census numbers next year are going to be a stark reminder for anybody who thinks that this country is not diverse. And every single one of us in our newsrooms will have some type of um, of contribution to telling that story. Um, and for instance, um, the Weather Channel, our, our new owner, well, he's owned us for what, a year now, he believes so strongly uh, that we cannot ignore the, uh, the English as a second language audience that next year we're launching the Weather Channel in Spanish. Um, it's going to be a completely, yeah, it's going to be a completely, in, uh, you know, independent, parallel um, news, uh, live news channel. Um, and even in our initial discussions, and this just, uh, you know, these things did not happen 15, 20 years ago when I first started. We didn't even consider how would we tell that story in Spanish um, for a domestic audience. But um, I've learned so much about the diversity that's happening in this country as we make plans to launch that network uh, next year. Um, you know, we're having conversations about, you know, well, now hold on, we can't, you know, we can't hire too many Puerto Ricans because the Cuban uh, dialect is also very important to the, the audience in South Florida. Or, you know, let's, let's get some more audience research on what the makeup is in these different DMAs across the country. Um, that just didn't happen. Considering how you serve your Spanish-speaking audience um, was just not top of mind for media companies. 10, 15 years ago. So I'm really proud to work for a company that does put diversity at the forefront. Um, and you wouldn't think that was an answer from the Weather Channel, but I just want to make sure I got that out there. <laughs> I was, I was going to add one. Uh, this is sort of a diversity with an asterisk, maybe, or an overlap. Um, and this will come naturally with diversity, but uh, I think it's important to have um, the, the different educational backgrounds and the different specialties. Like uh, maybe the Weather Channel is a little bit more special. But um, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, but I don't stay in like the scientist lane. You know, I'm working with the art designer. You know, that has a completely different background and looks at something completely different than than I would. And we get, you know, we ping pong back and forth, and ultimately we live. You come to a product that's going to be better if it was just him or just I that had had done it. Um, so having the and like I said, by by just doing diversity, you're going to get different viewpoints. But from educational and um, uh, you know, different specialties that people have, uh, you know, you need to have that diversity too. Well, I think that is a great note to end the big story with. Thank you all, and we'll be looking forward to the census next year to see how that <laughs> unfolds. It's, it's been a kind of a political hot potato, uh, and you may have just given us an idea for next year's symposium. 
So thank you very much.